Today is my first full day in Canada. I woke up and went for a hike around the Kekabeka Falls, and now I'm planning on running into Thunder Bay. I've seen the nature of Canada up close, and now it's time to see the people. What's strange is, I feel very out of place in this new land. I hadn't had the feeling yesterday, but upon entering Thunder Bay, I suddenly realized how little research I did on the laws of this new country. I suddenly started to feel paranoid and overthinking things. Day two, the Canadians have accepted me as one of their own. I walk among them, camouflaged, plain sight. Thanks, Pete. So, it's very weird when I feel a uh, uh, a little bit of culture shock at the moment for a couple different reasons. One, I didn't really research the uh, traffic laws too much and all of a sudden I found myself overthinking things like is it legal to take a right hand turn at a red light or a left hand turn at a solid green light? <laughs> what if there's like some sort of provincial thing? I know, yeah, and maybe I'm overthinking it. Actually, I was, I was watching for other cars to do it. I feel out of my comfort zone, for sure. All ten Canadian provinces and three territories have a very simple law that you can't make any modifications to a helmet. So, for the rest of this journey, I won't be using a helmet cam. I actually was riding around with the helmet cam into town, and then I caught a couple people looking at me. <laughs> so I looked up the laws and found that if there's any modifications to a helmet, that it could be, uh, that I could get pulled over and potentially have it towed if a cop's having a bad day. I took the helmet cam off and everything. I am in Canada, I am subject to their laws. I need to respect their country. But I've been spotting all these uh, different things around here. There's a couple, uh, couple stores that I did a little research on that I know about but never been inside of. One of them is the LCBO. The LCBO is the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. It's basically what all Ontarians must use as their liquor store, as it has a state-sanctioned liquor monopoly over the industry. In Minnesota, where I'm from, we either have small-time liquor stores or chains, which are privately owned. Some states have ABC stores or alcohol beverage control stores. In Ontario, however, if you'd like to go to the liquor store to pick up some hooch, you're more than likely going to have to go to the LCBO. It's what's known as a Crown Corporation, which is owned by the Provincial Government of Ontario and it operates over 650 liquor stores. It's a Crown Company. It's owned by the, the, the governing political body. And it's mostly historical, which is uh, unique. Because of its monopoly status, and because Ontario is the most populous province in Canada, the LCBO is the world's largest purchaser of alcoholic beverages. What is the LCBO and why is it a monopoly? To find out, we'll have to go back to the anti-alcohol social movements of the late 1800s and early 1900s. Both the US and Canada went through periods of what were called temperance movements. The temperance movement in Canada resulted in advertisement and awareness campaigns, marches, and protests that led to political pressure to outright ban alcohol on local, provincial, and even the national level. The United States had Prohibition too, just as Canada's nationwide Prohibition had ended. The U.S. had it from 1920 to 1933. I talked about U.S. Prohibition on my episode in the second oldest brewery in the U.S., the Shells Brewery in New Ulm, Minnesota. It somehow survived Prohibition, unlike many others. Prohibition in Canada was short-lived during two post-World War I years, from 1918 to 1920. In Ontario here, alcohol was illegal in the province from 1916 to 1927. The province to have it banned the latest was the small province of Prince Edward Island, which had banned alcohol until 1948. When Ontario finally legalized again, it had to be a compromise. Only the newly invented Crown Corporation, LCBO, which was owned by the provincial government, could sell alcohol to the people of Ontario, for the most part. Some exceptions would be small-time wineries and breweries, which were limited in number at the time. If you wanted to legally buy alcohol in Ontario, there were a lot of rules that came with it. From Ontario's legalization day to 1962, if you wanted to buy alcohol at the LCBO, you had to buy a permit. You had to show this permit when buying booze, and the amount of booze you'd buy would have to be recorded by the LCBO. It was kind of like a liquor license for an individual. You would have a permit serial number, and it would have to be renewed every year, and the government would track your purchases. For a long time, the permits were little booklets that looked like passports until they were replaced by cards. Here's where it gets even more bureaucratic. If you wanted to buy booze, you'd have to fill out an order form that would include your permit number and the volume and kind of liquor you'd like to buy. 
You'd present this form and your permit to the clerk at the front desk of the LCBO, and they'd go into the back of the store to get it for you, much like a pharmacy. If the amount you'd purchase was too high for that week, the LCBO could deny you the sale. If approved, the LCBO clerk would stamp the order and track the amount that you'd been purchasing. The reason for these laws were to prevent people from abusing their privilege and overconsuming alcohol. The intent was to have a government check on private alcohol consumption to prevent alcoholism, which was a huge driver of the temperance movements of generations past at the time. The LCBO even established a staff of investigators that would look into an individual's private life, such as their home, places of work and worship, and even conversing with neighbors and family to determine if an individual should be barred from purchasing liquor. If the LCBO were to do that and take your permit away, they would put you on what's called the interdiction list. It's a list of individuals that can no longer buy liquor. I actually got a hold of some of the investigative documents from back when the LCBO used to do this. Check these out and feel free to pause the video if you'd like to read them in full. This form is a notification from the LCBO to the retail stores that the people on this list are to be placed on the interdiction list for one year. This is a letter from the comptroller of a small town saying that a man is a habitual drinker, and although he causes no trouble, due to the amount he drinks, they believe he should be put on the interdiction list. His wife would also be happy to see him put on that list as well for the sake of his health. On this letter, a man voluntarily requests that he be put on the interdiction list for 12 months to help with his drinking habit. This one came from a local police department. A man had gotten drunk, made a scene at a church social, and was thrown out. He was then found by the police staggering in the middle of the highway, and then later found on another date to be drunk and looking for the keys to his vehicle when the police went to visit him again. This is another one from the police department, where the husband in question was found to be sober, but it was his wife who had claimed that he had a drinking problem. He had been well composed when he'd met with the officer, and the officer believes that the wife is putting too much pressure on the husband and his business. The husband also states that he hasn't had sex for about six weeks. I'm not kidding, going through some of these was pretty interesting. Also, being that the last year of this process was back in 1962, hypothetically, if you were 18 years old and put on the interdiction list on the last year this was still going on, that would put you at 78 years old today, which is around life expectancy. There could absolutely be LCBO reports on Ontarians on the interdiction list who are still alive today. To put this in perspective, from 1929 to 1951, over 125,000 individuals were added to the interdiction list. Eventually, over the decades, and as the politics of alcohol became more relaxed, the citizens of Ontario would be able to buy their own liquor without being tracked, and customers would be able to take the liquor off the shelves in the store themselves. Here's something even more interesting. When the talks of recreational marijuana legalization in Canada started, the LCBO said it would have the perfect infrastructure and distribution network to stock, control, and sell cannabis. The Ontario Cannabis Store, a new crown corporation, was founded as a subsidiary of the LCBO. They wouldn't sell in any of the same stores that they sell alcohol, so 40 new retail locations were established around Ontario to sell directly to the public in October of 2018 when pot was legalized in Canada. After the 2018 elections though, the new center-right Ontario government moved the OCS under the Minister of Finance directly and allowed private head shops to sell. The OCS now acts as a wholesale supplier to private stores in Ontario. We'll get more into the cannabis laws of Ontario later this season. Okay, I can already tell I'm getting carried away. I'd like everybody to know this is exactly why it took five years to do all 84 episodes of season three. I go to a place, I find out something interesting, I go into a rabbit hole about it, and then I make an episode on it. And so far, I haven't said a single thing about Thunder Bay, and this was supposed to be an episode on it, and we're already now 10 minutes in. So the episode has gone on probably long enough, but I'm gonna fit in one more store that's definitely different from my way of life, and then we'll get into Thunder Bay next episode. Here's another store I've never seen before. Canadian Tire. I have heard of Canadian Tire. I think it got its start as an auto centre and then blossomed into this, this huge company which is a mixture of, let's say, uh, Cabela's and Home Depot. So it's got like its sports section, home improvement sections, all kind of roped together under one roof uh, that has a lot of birds flying around in it. <laughs> 
Canadian Tire is a retail hub here in Canada. Entire communities orbit around it. It's one of those stores that you only go into for one thing and leave with way too much. Many go in there with nothing in mind, just to browse. It began in 1922 when John William Bill and Alfred Jackson Bill decided to use their savings to make an investment that would change Canadian retail forever. They had a combined savings of 1,800 Canadian dollars, which would be around 28,000 today. They took those savings and purchased a stake in the Hamilton Tire and Garage Company. It was a good time to get into the tire game because over the course of the Roaring Twenties, the automobile had exploded in ownership. In 1927, they changed their name to Canadian Tire because it sounded big. No doubt, because from then on, they started branching their tire company into whole new industries. The first of which was hardware, when Canadian Tire stores started selling Mastercraft hardware tools. And they didn't stop there. In order to bring in more consumer traffic, they branched into the petrol business and started manning gas stations known as Canadian Tire Gas Plus. They're now your one-stop shop for sporting gear, namely hockey, hunting gear, groceries, exercise equipment, Legos, kitchenware, even financial services at Canadian Tire Bank. In the future, keep an eye out for these guys. In a world being constantly consumed by Amazon and online retailers, there's still nothing like browsing through a store, in person, and finding all that crap you just don't need. Bring your family. Bring your dog. Bring that special someone you're looking to impress by browsing tires. Okay, that's all for now. In the next episode, I'm going to dive into the history of Thunder Bay, Canada's gateway to the west, here on Two Wheels, One Compass. And then when I went into Canadian Tire, I had to buy something. And I saw some fidget spinners, but eh, I didn't want to do that. So I bought a Canadian flag and some trail mix.